Professor Lieberman, why are you interested in studying firms' imitative behavior? One reason to study imitation is that it's a very common business phenomenon. Another reason is that in environments with a lot of uncertainty, imitation can lead to outcomes that prove to be very bad for companies and for society overall. For example, there was enormous uncertainty in the Internet sector in the late 1990s, and we saw a great deal of imitative behavior. Much of this behavior looks almost bizarre in retrospect. It's hard to believe that intelligent managers acted in the way that they did. And the duplication of investment wasted a lot of society's resources in the Internet sector and particularly in the related telecom sector. So why do firms imitate each other? There are a number of reasons. The most common type of imitation is when firms copy a successful product. For example, Apple has had great success with its iPod, and now we see many companies introducing similar products. The iPod has a high margin, and competitors are hoping that their products can capture some of the profits in this new product category. The motives here are straightforward and a fundamental part of the competitive process. In this case, everyone knows that the iPod has been successful. I find imitation to be more interesting in situations with greater uncertainty. In uncertain environments, there are two main motives for imitation. The first motive is based on the idea that the firm or firms being copied have superior information. Smaller firms might follow larger and more successful firms in the belief that they have information about what's likely to be successful. Alternatively, managers may observe that many companies making a certain or are taking a certain action. You see everyone else behaving in a certain way, and there's a tendency to believe that they must know what they're doing. So you might behave in the same way, even if you don't really have a clue that this behavior or action is a good one. We saw a lot of this type of imitation during the early days of Internet commerce. Many entrepreneurs started Internet businesses in part because they saw others starting similar businesses. Some early entrepreneurs may have been unusually perceptive, but in many cases the process was more like the blind leading the blind. The financial markets fell prey to some similar problems and tended to promote much of this behavior. The second motive for imitation relates to rivalry and the fact that firms are reluctant to fall behind their rivals. Say you are a manager and you see that your close competitor takes a particular action. Even if you think that this action is not likely to be successful, you may be tempted to copy in order to avoid the possibility of falling behind. For example, Barnes & Noble took many steps to imitate the features introduced by Amazon in selling books on the Internet. Managers are risk averse because they know that they can be fired if they miss an important trend pursued by rivals. However, if they make the same mistake as everyone else, the consequences are not likely to be so dire. These two motives, information and rivalry, can occur simultaneously. Managers may imitate because they believe that rivals have information and also because they fear falling behind. Your examples suggest that there are various types of business actions that are imitated. What are the domains where imitation tends to occur? The iPod example involves imitation of a new product, which is perhaps the most common domain for imitation, but there are many others. Uh, firms may imitate innovative processes or organizational forms. Uh, for example, auto companies have widely imitated the Toyota production system. Uh, during the late 1990s, consulting firms set up Internet business incubators, uh, which were perceived at the time as a superior organizational form. Much of the imitation during the rise of the Internet uh, was related to market entry. Uh, during that period, for example, business-to-business -business exchanges sprouted like weeds almost. Uh, and other types of business investments are often imitated. For example, uh, investments in productive capacity. Many of your examples have ultimately worked out badly, particularly in the case of Internet businesses. Have you concluded anything about whether imitation is good or bad? Clearly, it depends on the situation and whether you take the perspective of the firm or its customers. Apple would like to prevent imitation of its iPod, but it lacks sufficient control of the basic technology through patents or other means. But Apple can maintain its lead 
uh, if it's able to come up with new and better versions of the iPod, as it did recently with an iPod that stores photos as well as music. From a consumer standpoint, this type of imitation is likely to be beneficial. It drives prices down and it forces Apple uh, to come up with new innovations. Likewise, imitation of the Toyota production system has made the entire auto industry more efficient. Yet Toyota has been able to maintain its lead by continually improving the production system. This is the gale of creative destruction that Joseph Schumpeter wrote about many years ago. Firms put pressure on each other and they learn from each other, which makes society better off. In situations with high uncertainty, that's where you get often the worst outcomes, both for firms and for society. When uncertainty is high, imitation leads firms to pursue similar paths. In effect, they all end up putting their eggs mostly in the same basket. Uh, this leads to a sort of amplification effect that raises the collective risk for firms in the industry. If firms have chosen the right path, imitation promotes faster movement in the right direction. But if firms have chosen the wrong path, imitation can be disastrous. In the internet era, for example, it's clear that we got too many B2B exchanges, too many business incubators, too many internet pet supply retailers, and so on. And meanwhile, the telecom companies imitated each other's investments in optical fiber and created a sea of overcapacity, which caused prices to plummet. Many of the accounting scandals in the telecom sector grew out of a desire to hide the losses created by this imitative overinvestment. So what are the lessons here for managers? Are there situations where managers should be particularly careful about imitating others? One lesson, perhaps the main lesson, is to be wary of imitation when the environment is very uncertain. There may seem to be a security in following others, but often it's deceptive. It's important for managers to think independently. Most of those who pursued the fads of the internet era have done poorly, whereas those who resisted the fads have often done very well. Thank you very much, Professor Lieberman. My pleasure. Thank you.